Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Well, hello there, family. How y'all doing? Happy Memorial Day weekend. We thank you for worshiping with us when you could have been doing Memorial Day weekend things. So uh, it's good to have all of you here and to have you uh, join us in our worship together. And uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear God, we just pray that your presence would continue to be in this place, that you would fill us. And particularly, Lord, I just pray that you would speak. As I'm talking about something that's somewhat complex, I pray that you would um, break it down and help each person to hear the message that you need them to hear. Pray in your name. Amen. So we are finishing up our Great Questions series, which I love doing. I think it's so fun to have you pick the topics. And uh, last week, I have to be straightforward with you. I wasn't here, and John, uh, Pastor John, did a fabulous job covering that topic, and I really appreciate him doing it. Um, and I, but I was watching. I was watching, and so I saw what my question was going to be, and I thought, oh, when I said, I know the answer to that. Why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't God have just forgiven us? And when I saw, I saw it up on the screen, I was like, oh, good. Easy week. I will go ahead and just do some, I know what I'm going to say. I have it, I have it figured out. And then I sat down and started studying. <laughs> and uh, whoever gave me this question, good job. <laughs> really good job. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> I have pages of Bible verses, quotes from scholars, and I started sorting through that and began wondering how I was going to put that into a 25-minute sermon. In fact, it kind of reminded me of, uh, of a time when uh, my kids were much younger. Eric was probably three or four, and uh, I had to take my wedding band in to get repaired, and I had the two kids in the car with me. And they said, well, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to go take uh, my wedding band to get it repaired. And, and they said, well, are they going to give it back to you? I said, well, they're probably going to have to work on it. I'll probably have to drop it off and leave it with them. And Eric became very concerned. He said, Daddy, how will people know that you and Mommy are married <laughs> if you don't have your wedding band on? And before I could say something, my daughter, who is a great deal older than my son, 19 months, <laughs> decided to make sure that my son had the privilege of her infinite superior knowledge, Eric, everybody will know because he has red lips, because he and mommy kiss. By the way, I have both of my children's permission to share that story with you. <laughs> and so as I look at this question, after a week of, literally a week of agonizing over how to make this sermon happen, making changes up until the last minute, literally, I want to come to you and say that this is going to be my red lips answer. Um, Ellen White, who is uh, the co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and also um, an inspired author and writer, looked at this question, so to speak, and she called this the science of redemption. And what I found fascinating about what she said is that the science of redemption, according to Ellen, will be studied throughout all eternity. You know how science works, right? Science works that you, that you put out a thesis, a proposal, and then you try to validate it. 
And if you find a better theory, you have to go with that one. So what I want to say to you is, it seems a little arrogant for Ken Wetmore, five-year-old Ken Wetmore, to get up on this stage and say, I've got this figured out. If Ellen is correct, and this is the science of redemption that will be studied throughout all eternity. Another fairly prolific writer named Paul, who wrote a large portion of the New Testament, in 1 Timothy 3.16 calls this question a great mystery. So I really want to be clear that as I share with you today, what I'm sharing with you is my red lips answer. It's a theory. If you have a better theory, I'm happy that you may be 19 months ahead of me. And I hope that you too will have the humility to keep studying. Because just because I have an answer that feels right to me, like I said, when I heard this question, I was like, oh, I know what, I, I know what I'm going to say. But as I studied it further, I was like, oh, wow, there's some gaps in my theory. There's some things. And if this is the science that we're going to study throughout all eternity, let's enjoy it. When Paul calls it a mystery, mysteries aren't meant to just be put over on the shelf and left alone. In my opinion, mysteries are meant to be explored, studied, tried to solve. And so that's what we're going to do today. And like I said, here's my red lips answer to why did Jesus have to die and couldn't God have just forgiven us? So let's start off with that first question. And by the way, I told you I have notes and notes text and Bible text. I really debated, do I, do I do kind of a proof text sermon where I prove my theory textually? And I decided not to, because I like paying attention to how Jesus does things. And I noticed that Jesus, when he got hard questions, would tell stories. So today, I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories. I'm going to share some Bible verses with you, but I'm going to really focus on the stories. And what I'd love those stories to do is be a springboard for you as you analyze this question for yourself and kind of take a look at what it could mean for you and what you believe. So why did Jesus have to die? First story. When I was um, in my other career as a reporter and news anchor um, on the island of Guam, by the way, thank you. So I had a number of you send me text messages this week telling me that you're praying for the people of Guam, my friends that live on Guam, where, where we lived for six years, um, because of the typhoon, Typhoon Moar, that came through. And it was kind of interesting watching the news reports, and they said it's, it's going to be the biggest typhoon in 20 years since Typhoon Bunks and Wall hit the island. I recovered that one, and I remember it quite well. Um, and so I, am, I appreciate your prayers. I am happy that the news reports say that uh, there have been no fatalities. Most of the island right now is without power and water, so do please pray for them. If it's anything like Typhoon uh, Bung Sun Wa that I got to cover, we were without power for, I believe, seven or eight weeks. It was a long time, and then we were without water for almost a week. So definitely keep um, the uh, folks on Guam in your prayers. I appreciate that. But when I was there as a reporter and an anchor, uh, we were a smaller station. So during the day, I would go out and get news stories. I covered politics, and I covered the military. And then I would come back, write like crazy, and hopefully be ready for the 6 o'clock newscast. And if I had time, I got to read through all the other reporter stories that were going to be on the newscast ahead of time. And if I didn't, I got to go read them cold. Um, and that could be entertaining um, at times. But this particular time, it was, it was a real struggle because I, I started reading a story that I hadn't seen ahead of time. And it was a story that made me so angry I could barely read it. Um, and the story was that a young man was out driving drunk. And this man had a history of um, reckless driving. And he was out driving drunk, and he ran into another vehicle and killed the woman who was driving it and her unborn child. And that hit home for me as I was reading it because at that point, Rochelle was expecting Kyla. And it was very easy for myself to put myself in the place of the, of the husband who had just lost a wife and a first child to somebody's careless, reckless disregard for life. 
and I, I was furious. And I remember just feeling, just saying in the newsroom, I, I hope they throw the book at this guy. I, I, I just, I mean, this is so preventable. And uh, so a couple weeks later, I, I almost completely lost it on the air when I was reading the follow-up to the story. And uh, the follow-up was that the district attorney had lowered the felonies down to misdemeanors, had given the guy time served, and was letting him go. And I was livid. And I went and found the reporter that covered what we called it cops and courts. And uh, I said, Mindy, what on earth? Why, weren't, why, why wasn't there a story with you going after the district attorney for, for, for failing to do the district attorney's job and be, and, and be a deterrent to this kind of bad behavior? I mean, think about the family. What are they thinking right now? And she said, well, Ken, you know I'm good at my job. <laughs> and I did go and talk to the district attorney. And he told me that he would talk to me off the record about it because he didn't want it to go on the record. I said, but he didn't. And she said, no, but listen... The husband of the woman who was killed and the baby came with the family to the district attorney and asked the district attorney to lower the charges to misdemeanor and to give the sentence that was agreed upon. Because the husband said, there has been enough life that has been taken. He said, I want to sit down with the young man, and I want to tell the young man, you took my wife's life, now you better go live a life that's worthwhile. You need to go do something with your life. Because my, there is no do-overs for my wife and my dead child. But you, you can do something. And he extended grace in the hopes that this young man would make something of his life. And he asked the district attorney not to make it public. And so the, I gave kudos to that district attorney for being willing to take the hit on his crime and punishment and not share why he was not going after this kid. So why did Jesus have to die? There are two words that, whether you're Catholic or Seventh-day Adventist, most Protestants, in fact, in my research, it seemed like at least 80 to 90% of Christianity will agree on two words that have to do with why did Jesus have to die, and they are the words substitutionary atonement. What does that mean? That's where 80 to 90% of people will disagree. So we all agree, substitutionary atonement, oh, I shouldn't say we all, most of us in Christianity agree, substitutionary atonement. What does that mean? And how does that work? That's where 80 to 90% of us are going to agree, disagree with each other. In fact, in theological circles, there's a joke that if you get five theologians in a room, you're going to have 10 different opinions on this particular topic. So, um, so substitutionary atonement, by my definition, okay, is basically that, and by the, what the Seventh-day Adventist Church would teach is this, simply that Jesus took on the penalty of your sins, and substituted himself in your place. The Bible says the wages of sin are death, therefore somebody had to die, and Jesus took that on for us. If you do the research like I do and Google it, um, Jesus dying for our sins, he died for us, is replete through the New Testament. So, like I said, there are, however, many, many other theories about, well, was he our substitute or did he simply come and just live a good life to prove that it could be done? And, he, and, and so, again, like I said, there's lots of different ways of going about this. Um, but why did Jesus have to die? The short answer is, from my theological understanding, that a penalty needed to be in place. 
Why? Because when there aren't penalties for being selfish and doing wrong, chaos ensues. If the district attorney on Guam had said, you know what, we're no longer going to prosecute drunk driving ever, there'd be repercussions for that. Um, one of the... <laughs> One of my uh, experiences uh, is I uh, was going a little too fast, and by a little I mean a lot, and a police officer pulled me over and gave me the opportunity to attend traffic school instead of getting a ticket. And one of the things that always stuck out to me about traffic school, the one thing that I remember from it was that they presented to us, they said, you're probably pretty angry you got a ticket. And I was like, yeah, I don't like getting it. And they say, you probably wish that we'd give out less tickets, right? Yep. And so let, let, it, let us show you a graph. And what they did is they said, here's a graph of how many tickets the police department gives out every year, traffic citations. And here's a graph of how many traffic-related fatalities they are every year. And it was incredible to watch because one year the police department had decided decided on purpose to give less tickets. They said, we're going to put our energies elsewhere. And what you saw was the traffic fatalities soar because there was a direct correlation between enforcement and bad behavior, <laughs> speeding, um, or whatever else. And so that has always stuck with me. And so when we talk about why did Jesus have to die, well, maybe because there needs to be an example of what happens when selfishness prevails. It, it goes to something that's very hard for me to, to feel good about in the Old Testament when we see lambs being slaughtered wholesale and, and, and you're like, why? that's awful. But for me, perhaps, that was to make the point that that's the result of sin. It causes hurt, it causes pain, and it doesn't just cause it to you. It's not just you who suffers from sin, it's the world around you. When I am unkind and unselfish, and when I'm selfish, part of me, it hurts everything around me. Which kind of goes into that second question, couldn't God just have forgiven us? And I have to tell you, I believe the answer to that is yes, he could have. Because God can do anything. God is all-powerful, and so if you believe in an all-powerful God, you have to believe God could have done it. But perhaps another story will help us a little here. So another story from when I was reporting, um, I covered politics, also, as I mentioned. And one of the uh, people that I covered quite a bit was a senator in the Guam legislature. And I really, I covered this guy enough. He was making news enough that I, I saw him several times a week, uh, sometimes every day during a week. And I got to know the guy and I liked him. Very likable, very nice guy. Um, always pleasant. And as a reporter, when you're a reporter, one of the things you like the most is when you are on a deadline and you need a quote and somebody gives it to you. And this guy was always available for a quote. And not just when it was self-serving for him, it was, he was available when, I, when he, I needed a favor. And so I really liked the guy a lot. And when Kylo was born, he showed up at the hospital, brought flowers, kissed the baby like a good politician was supposed to do. And, uh, but I liked him, liked him a lot. Well, shortly after Kyla was born, I had a whistleblower send me some information. And they sent information that this particular senator was taking funds out of his operating budget for his office, which is taxpayer funded, and taking those funds and using them for his campaign for re-election. Now, I had a choice. I could go ahead and listen to what that person had to say, or I could go ahead and say, you know what, that's my friend. He'd never do a thing like that. But I investigated. And the deeper I dug, the more obvious it was that he was guilty as charged. And so I had to do the hard thing of picking up the phone and calling him and saying, hey, I need an interview. Oh, cool, yeah, no problem, I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, you might, uh, I'm just going to let you know. Um, it's because we're, we're seeing finances from your office being funded over here, and it's, that's what the interview is going to be about. Ken, you know me. I wouldn't do a thing like that. I said, great. Well, come on down, and let's, let's 
if you, I'd love for you to, to show that I'm wrong. He came down, it was one of the, if you're a journalist, it, it was a great interview. <laughs> for him, it was an awful interview because, I mean, it was bad. I, I, I had him. I mean, I had him. And in fact, it was so bad at one point, he just started laughing, like the nervous laugh where you're just like, you know you're God and there's nothing else you can do on, on tape. <laughs> And I ran it. And afterward, I heard from him, I thought we were friends. How could you make me look so bad? How could you do that? And my answer is, how can I not? It's about my values, and it's about who I am. If I do favors for you, what does that make me? It takes away my integrity. It takes away my trustworthiness. And I, don't, I didn't enjoy it. In fact, I felt bad about it. Probably much worse than he thought. <laughs> but I had to do it because it was part of what my values were and who I am as a person. So could God have forgiven us? I believe that God could have. But could God have done that and lived up to the values that God says God has. God says that love is the law of the universe. Lucifer has argued that selfishness is what's best. Satan. Satan basically says, look, God's selfish. Everybody else should be selfish. And God says, I'm not selfish. Everybody should be selflessly loving. And Lucifer says, that's easy to say when you're God. We're all doing what you want us to do. Selfish. And God says, no, trust me, I'm loving. And Satan says, okay, sure you are. And so God says, no, selfless love is what 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 says. And Lucifer says, yeah, you wouldn't, you, you couldn't do that. Nobody can do that. Everybody puts themselves first. And those human beings that sinned, you'll forgive them because you, you, you need to do that because they're your buddies. And so the God of the universe said, fine, I will prove that I'm love. And this, by the way, is why one of the important parts of the Trinity doctrine that, and one of the reasons I think it's important because if Jesus was created, it takes away from God's love. But if God sent God's self, if God became man, truly became, didn't create somebody else to do his dirty work, but God truly became human, then that's the ultimate proof of love. So why did Jesus have to die? Can I rephrase that question and say, maybe why did Jesus have to be born? Why did Jesus have to live? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to be resurrected? Because Paul said, if Jesus hadn't been resurrected, our hope is in vain. So I think it's important that Jesus did all those things. He lived selflessly for 30 plus years on this earth. I can't get past 30 seconds, friends. 30 years of selfless living. And then on the cross, we hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experiences what the penalty of the true penalty you and I, when we get old and die, that's not the real penalty because we believe in a resurrection. But the real penalty is to be forever separated from God. That's the real penalty. And Jesus experienced what that felt like on the cross. My God, my God, why have you, where are you? You're not here. I don't feel you. And Jesus had to exhibit the faith that you and I are asked to exhibit that to move past what we feel and believe what we've been told. On that cross, Jesus, I don't believe, felt like he was going to be resurrected, but he believed in faith that God would do what God said God would do, that he would be resurrected. But he experienced what it felt like to, to face that eternal death. And the amazing thing is that's how much he loves you and me. He was willing to die for forever. He didn't pull himself off. He didn't say, never mind. You hear him in the garden. By the way, it must be a little bit of a mystery to Jesus too because if there's any other way, if this cup can be removed, do it. And I have to think as a loving father, if there was any other way, I would find another way. 
So, and I believe that God loved Jesus more than I love my kids. All God, all man. But God gave us the best, selflessly, and answered conclusively, in my opinion, the question about whether God is selfish or not. Jesus is the proof that God is selfless, that God is love. And that's why you should love him. Jesus didn't have to die. He could have just left us alone and let chaos take over. God could have forgiven us without any penalty, but then chaos would have taken over. And one of the things that we see about God is that God brings order out of chaos. It's the story of creation. Very beginning, it says, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void. And what that word really means is chaos. It was in chaos. And God brings order out of it. Family, my red lips, my red lips theory is incomplete. And I'm looking forward to studying th- throughout all eternity. But this thing I know as I close, God did forgive us. And that's why Jesus, God became one of us and took on the consequences of our sins. God wants us and all creation to follow God out of love not fear. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the ultimate proof that God is love as God claims to be. Love is the law of the universe. Jesus' willingness to lay down his life, to experience separation from God, hell, the feeling that he might never live again on the cross is the ultimate proof of God's unselfish love, and that is why God is worthy of our love. Thank you so much, Roger. Roger Ryan is uh, back from Nashville, and we are so happy to have him. Welcome home, Roger. Thank you for sharing with us. We are actually out of time, so we have no time for questions, but I will do a little tiny teaser that we can maybe address during the podcast this week. Okay. So here's one. If God made the rules, why did he make the penalty for sin to be death? It could have been anything. Why was it death? We can talk about that. Yeah. Have to listen to the podcast for that. Yes. All right. Well, so this is the end of this series. No more great questions for the rest of the year. But you can get your questions ready for next year because we're going to do this again. Except next year, we're going to do 12 weeks of great questions. What, are you not okay with that? You know, Melanie, you're in charge. We're, uh, <laughs> we're just, uh, <laughs> Actually, next week we are starting a brand new series that I am very excited about because one of my really good friends is going to be the guest speaker kicking it off. You know her too, right? I, I'm, a, I'm familiar. Familiar yeah. with, with um, our guest speaker. Uh, I love this series, by the way. I think it's so important for us to hear from voices in our church. And so... Uh, You're going to hear from a number of different uh, voices, and we're going to kick it off with uh, my wife, Rochelle Wetmore. So uh, Rochelle is uh, going to be talking about when loving isn't pleasing. And uh, she has a lot of experience with sermons. In fact, uh, I was telling her the troubles I was having with this sermon, and she was like, you need to tell the red lips story. So... You'll look forward to her. She's gonna, she's gonna definitely bring it next week, and I'm excited for you all to get to hear her voice. She, she tends to be a little bit more introverted and quiet, so this will be fun for her to, or fun for me to see her up front doing this. So this will be fun. I'm looking forward to this. And we there's have a, some there's other... another voice next week. Yes, that we're gonna be hearing. Yeah, my son Eric Rochelle uh, talked, uh, asked Eric if he would sing at the end of her sermon. So awesome. So lots of voices for next week. Don't want to miss this. uh, And the next few weeks after that. So I'm really excited about this We have some fantastic voices lined up for you for uh, this this, uh, next month. So it's going to be fantastic. Great. Well, thank you for tackling our big questions this series. Thank you, Melanie. 
I feel like next year I get to I get to pick one and just say, Melanie, you get to do that one, right? So just I just decide one that I'm like, you know what, Melanie's going to do it. So there we go. All right. So thank you all so much for being here today. I do want to take a moment, though, and say something. You often don't see the volunteers that are doing things. You may not even notice the people that are up running the cameras and who are in the back rooms doing switching and different things like that. But they're what makes it possible for all of our family that are not able to be here in person to be a part of it. And so I want to say thank you to them. But I also want to point out that two of that group are getting married tomorrow. So Matthew and Amy, who are... And in spite of having a big weekend, they both volunteered to help today. So thanks so much to Matthew and Amy. We love you guys, and we're so happy and excited for your future together. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our family. We pray you bless us, each and every one, that we would go and love you and our world in ways that are meaningful and make a difference. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, family. I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast-related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening, and have a great week.